And we'll be in Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. If you want to grab it, it would just be one verse then in Numbers chapter 29. Let's pray. Grateful, as always, to just gather together and be in this house together, a family of believers coming together to, to worship together, to, to sing songs and, and lift up our praises to you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you continue to do for us. And we're grateful now for a time like this when we can just stop from the sometimes madness of our weeks and the busyness of life and, and open your word together. I pray you, you use this time to feed and refresh and, and replenish and encourage and equip and, and, and challenge us even sometimes if it's necessary where it hurts a little bit so that we might be the kind of people that you want us to be. Thank you for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all God's people said, amen. All right, Leviticus chapter 23, 23 to 25 is where we will start. Verse 23 of Leviticus 23 reads, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And if you want, we'll just flip over a couple of books to the right, Leviticus, or Numbers chapter 29, verse 1, just the verse 1 there, which reads, On the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a day for you to blow the trumpets. That's it. Like we can close our Bibles and go home, right? What I want to do and what we do with these fall feasts is let's just briefly look at the context. What's going on? Remember, this is, this is thousands of years before us, a feast that was, that was instituted of God. We looked at last week, Leviticus 23 begins with basically in layman's terms for us today, I want you to get your tablets out, your, your, your palm pilots, your calendars, whatever it is you use. And I, w- I want you to write these dates down on your calendar because I want to meet with you. One of these in the fall is the Feast of Trumpets. It's a holy convocation, which is a sacred gathering. It's a gathering of people where God said, on this day, I want you to stop. With all the feasts, the spring and the fall, a part of that feast is stop working. Stop doing what you're doing. I don't want to belabor that point because next week we will belabor that point. But with all the feasts, I want you to stop what you're doing. And basically, I want you to pay attention to me. I mean, does that make sense in the world in which we even live where that might be necessary? When even, say, in a marriage, we get so distracted with our tablets and, and, and whatever we have that we might need to be told, why don't you put down what you're so busy doing and worrying about and just look at each other? Actually, that should be your homework assignment this week. Just stare at somebody this week. And, and see what you might be missing. Try it. Um, so what is the Feast of Trumpets that we're looking at today? Now, it's called, around circles you might hear, it might even be on your calendars, Rosh Hashanah, which literally just means the head of the year. That is not a term that you'll see necessarily associated with this feast in Leviticus or in, in Numbers. It's not called that. It's, it's talk, talked about in Rosh Hashanah. It's a lot of people will talk about this as the Jewish New Year. This is a day that marks the beginning of the year. This is a day almost like our New Year's Day where we stop, have a feast, celebrate, and think about the past and the future, setting goals, New Year's resolutions. You could really look at it in a very similar way to that. Now, in Leviticus 23 that we read in verse 24, this particular feast, literally the Hebrew there just reads, it's called a memorial blast. It is a, it is a memorial, literally just loud noise, shout. The, 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 the same Hebrew word is used for shouting. It is a memorial shout, a memorial blast, a blowing of the trumpet. That's what it is called. Leviticus 23, 24 again said, this is a memorial of blasting the trumpets, a holy convocation. In Numbers chapter 29, verse 1 that we read, the day is called in verse 1 of chapter 29, this is a day 
of blast. I kinda, it's the, what is the day of Feast of Trumpets? It's a blast. It is a day of a loud noise, a day of a shout, a holy convocation again, literally, or, or, or as we read it in verse, chapter 29, verse 1, it said this. It's a holy convocation, a sacred gathering. Stop what you're doing. Meet together. Don't do any ordinary work. It is a day to blow the trumpets. So, <clears throat> if you want to understand the context of Scripture, and somebody asks you today, what did you learn about? We learned about the Feast of Trumpets. And so he said, that's interesting. What is the Feast of Trumpets about? You would say... It's a blast <laughs> with that. It, it's just a day to blow the trumpets. And then most of us would say, that's why you went to church? <laughs> okay. Well, hold on a second. So summarize, Rosh Hashanah is a New Year-like festival, a day of remembrance, marked by a loud blast of the trumpet. And the main themes of this day, according to the, the few verses that we read, are very simply rest, remembrance, and trumpet blasts. Okay? Are we on the same page? That's pretty simple. Now here's the question. What was the purpose of the trumpets? Why a trumpet? Why is this a day that is just for blasting a loud noise? So the previous five years, we've had somebody come and, you know, we've had saxophones in here. We've, I don't even know if we've ever had a trumpet. The first year we did it, somebody came to, to do it for me and was dressed up, and I'm kind of staring in their direction. I don't want to say their name, but, and, and thought I was going to have them, like, almost maybe do a concert, I thought. But I said, they got here, and I said, what do you want? I said, I just want you to blow the most loud, irritating, and noise you possibly can do. That's all I want. And every year we've done it since. Well, Bonnie, a few weeks ago, found this or got this and gave me a, this is a shofar. This is the, now normally, this is what I'm calling a mini shofar. They're, they're big. And they're long. This is what you would hear in a, in a Jewish context being blown as the shofar. I literally almost passed out in my office on Tuesday trying to figure out how to work this thing. As you heard earlier, I barely got it. Sounds more like a, a yak being tortured in the, the woods or something. I don't know. But here's why we do it. This is why I want to do it during the moment of friendship. Literally, what you don't know that happens when we finish the song that we're playing as you're mingling and talking. When I'm in the band and, and we're up there, Jenny and I are literally screaming at the top of our lungs to get you all to shut it and come back together. And none of you listen to us. There's one time a year when every one of you, upon one blast, stop what you're doing, and it literally looks like this from my vantage point. You all are back here mingling and talking, and I go... I sound horrible. And you went like this, which from, from my perspective looks like this. Every one of you stops what you're doing, no talking, and you stare. What is the purpose of the trumpets? To stop, get your attention, call us together. And it works. This little thing worked. It worked. It worked so good that I honestly think I'm going to start carrying this with me everywhere that I go. <clears throat> if any of you have teenagers, you have the same problem. If your teenager has a cell phone, they technically, like, they have texting and phone calls and stuff. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this. If you're trying to text and call a teenager, it doesn't work. For some reason, it doesn't connect to their phone. They never get a hold of you. So here's what I'm going to do. Maria, if you're listening... Like, say, we're at the fair, and I'm trying to text you 50 times, and you refuse to answer the call. I'm going to carry this baby. And I'm going to stand in the middle of the fair, and I'm going to go, ah, family, unite. <laughs> and I guarantee you, my teenage daughter will come running to me at that point. Yeah, she obviously is going to work the other way. And actually, what somebody told me is it looked like I had a gun in my pocket when I had it here like this. So the point of it is it stops you in your tracks, it gets your attention, and it reminds you of something. So why, on this day, which again, if you look at any of the feasts, there, there are a number of things that are involved with these feasts. A number of things, and we don't have time to look into every detail of them. Next week, we'll look at the most detail. The Day of Atonement is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely. When... Uh, I, I can't go there because I will get it. Next week, you've got to be here. If you make one Sunday this whole next year, be here next week. It's phenomenal. And it feeds off of today so perfectly. Why this day, of all the other things, 
Numbers 29 says, this is a day of the blasting of the trumpets that should be on the calendar of your lives. What is the purpose of the trumpet? We've said some of them already. Call our attention. Wake up. It's an alarm. It could be a warning. It's a battle cry. I want to alert everyone. If you read in, in, um, in the book of Nehemiah, when, when the people are working on the wall and trying to rebuild the wall in Nehemiah, Nehemiah actually uses a trumpet in that place where he says, because there, there's outsiders, there's opposition who are trying to stop the people building on the wall. And so you might, you, in Nehemiah, you have families listed all along the wall who are working on various parts. Well, we're spread out right now. And so in Nehemiah, you can actually read where he says, if there's trouble that breaks out in one area, we will blow the trumpet, we will blast the horn, and all the rest of our family of believers will know, stop what you're doing and run to that spot because it's about to be on. You've come against one of us and we're going to get you. I picture like a real, like, video, music video of now fight dancing and all sorts of stuff happening, but it, not quite like that. But it's about to be on. The trumpet warns us there's trouble. It's a call to attention. It's a call to wake up. It's alarming and it gets me going and I got to come together. It's announcement. It's calling together. And again, if you look at what happens during the moment of friendship one time a year when we blast this thing, I, honestly, I think we should start doing it every week. It stops us and realizes there's something about to happen. Right? It's a wake-up call. If you start to think then with a new year and remembering and thinking, it's also a wake-up call to repentance and remembrance. Just like we would do on our new year. It's a time of year to say, I look back to see where I've been and maybe I've gotten off track a little bit. There's some goals I want to set. There's some things that I want to get right in my life. There's some priorities. There's some habits. There's some things that I want to do and a realization that maybe I've done some things I shouldn't have done and I want to get that stuff right. And what happens with this day, now, now for us it'll be seven days from here till next Sunday. In, in, in the, the Jewish festival calendar, what you'll have is from the Feast of Trumpets, which actually occurs in the next few weeks, it's, it's not this weekend, but the Feast of Trumpets begins what's known as the Ten Days of All, which is a period of days where we are to now enter into a time of reflection personally, of self-examination, of thinking about my own life and maybe the things that I've done wrong, that I need to get right, evaluating where I'm at in my relationship with God. And it enters into this 10 days of awe that begins with the marking of the, the blasting of the trumpets, wakes me up. I now spend the next 10 days evaluating, thinking about, looking at my own life. And then we come back together for the next big holy convocation, which is the Day of Atonement. So, I think I'll say it at the end, but part of what I hope the blasting of the shofar, the trumpet today, would do for us is what would it be like for us this week, the challenge is, to spend this week in reflection, repentance, remembrance, and thinking about our own lives individually and where we stand with God. Think about this week. To spend some time this week thinking about where my life is at, and where I want to go. I'm going to tell you right now, if you honestly took this seriously, this can be a bit of a, a tough week. But I would encourage you to really do it, to really think about areas of my life that I need to get right, and to really start to think about that. And I'm asking you to think about doing that. And there's a question I want to ask us as we begin church next week that to me is what makes this next feast and festival, the Day of Atonement, so absolutely powerful. But really take some time to think about repentance, awareness, examination, and getting myself ready. I think a lot of us think, well, if I just say I'm sorry, repentance might earn God's forgiveness, or repentance does. Repentance does not earn God's salvation. I mean, if you ever uh, little kids and they did something wrong, and go tell your brother you're sorry. That's usually what happens in my house. There's like, 
It starts with that, like a cry, and then it's, I'm, I'm sorry that you're so stupid. That doesn't make it right. Repentance doesn't earn forgiveness. It's, it's valuable and it serves as a link, and that's why next week is so important. This week of thinking about repentance and thinking about where maybe I've gotten off track is so, to me, vitally important. My very, very good friend, Dr. Phil, says that you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So part of why this week is so valuable is spending some time thinking about what do I need to own up to? Where have I gotten off track? What do I need to do? What challenges do I need in my life? On kickoff Sunday, if, if RG3 shows up today at one o'clock for the first time, I'm here to play football. I haven't done it in I don't know how long. I mean, the Browns, on, I love the Browns, but they honestly may look like they've never played a game in their lives. But they don't do that, right? They have been practicing for years and years and years. I mean, I'm imagining a guy like RG3, Roethlisberger, whoever, Brett Favre, they've been playing. Well, Brett's retired now, if you don't know that, but he's a Hall of Famer. Um, <laughs> they've, been, they've been playing since the time they were this little. And over the course of time, do you think that those professional athletes never once had a person say to them, there's some things you need to get better if you expect to go to the next level? In the church, we don't want that often. I just want everything to feel good and be fluffy and nice and tell me I'm, I'm okay. And, and we should have that. But if you don't ever walk out of church at some point and feel like you've been kicked in the stomach a little bit and be challenged, I'm not quite sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you. And so part of the process of this week is, let's challenge ourselves this week. I want to face the hard truths and the hard realities of my life. And maybe I'm looking for somebody who would be in my life that won't just tell, sugarcoat it for me. If I'm being a butthead, tell me I'm being a butthead. That's an official Greek term for that, but just don't worry about it. So the purpose of the trumpets, wake me up, repentance. Keep in mind, this is not earning God's forgiveness but it's waking me up to maybe realities or deeper things that are going on in my life that I don't want to deal with. I want to band-aid it and not deal with it. So to me, what is the context of the Feast of Trumpets? It's a day of blasting the trumpets. And then somebody says, okay, that's great. Why? Well, it's a wake-up call. It's a reminder. It's a call to repentance. It's a call to come together. It's alarming. It's a warning. What is the purpose of the Feast of Trumpets then for us today? What is, what is the spiritual significance for us today? And my challenge for us today that I would ask us to consider is that I believe that the spiritual significance of the Feast of Trumpets for us today is to live ready. To live ready. As Christians, to live ready. To always be ready to give an answer for our faith. To always be ready in case today is the day that I'm to go home and to be with the Lord. There's things we don't want to talk about and think about, but to live ready. Maybe just in general, we should ask ourselves the question right now, am I ready? Am I ready if that day was today? Spiritually, I believe it's time for us to think about this is a time to wake up. It's a time to get ready. It's a time to remember the promises of God. We did a very similar sermon this time last year. But I guarantee for all of us, just like New Year's resolutions, we've forgotten a lot of stuff. We got stale this last year. We got crusty. We got a little upset about stuff. We made some promises to God and things I'm going to do, and we just forgot to do it. I love watching like outside around January or something, and you can see everybody's got like the new Christmas workout outfit, made New Year's resolutions, and I'm going to pound the pavement, baby. I'm going to be working out every day. That's my New Year's resolution. Anybody been there? How many have got stuff collecting dust since January, the second week of January? And so I think spiritually it's the same thing. So why do we need this as an annual reminder? Because I know I need annual reminders. Live ready. So the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? I want to take you to two, <clears throat> or one New, New Testament passage and then a passage in Jeremiah. So over to 1 Thessalonians. Again, if you want to follow along, I'll turn there kind of quickly and read this. They should be notes in the bulletin. You could also catch these on the website if you would like to grab these later. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. It says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, 
that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Asleep means that they've died. We, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who have passed away and, and grieving like people who have no hope. I lost a family member and I'm not sure about their, their future in heaven and, and, I, and I have no hope. He says, I, I, we want you not to be uninformed. Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and Jesus rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The trumpet calling the people together. Then we who are alive, verse 17, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. But the trumpet call of God brings the people together. In Jeremiah chapter 6, now back Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. This one is a little tougher to read, but because I think it is an indication sometimes of our own hearts spiritually, we just don't like to say things like this. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the the roads, the the crossroads, and look. Stand by this crossroads and look and, and ask for the ancient pathways where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. God said, I want you to stand. You're, you're standing at a crossroads right now. And I want you to ask for the ancient pathways. We live in a world where everything brand new is offered as something that will, that will change our lives and it'll be wonderful. And God said, I'd like you to stand at the crossroads. Maybe you're on right this minute. And I would want you to ask for the ancient pathways. What might the ancient pathways be? For me, it's the word of God. It's prayer. It's I want you to go back to the things that have been since the beginning that will bring true meaning, value, lasting significance to your lives peace, contentment that will help us through any trial or circumstance we may face. Sometimes it feels old, it's dated, it's boring. We don't want to do it. It feels like work. Who wants to wake up and read and hear about Leviticus? But I'm saying, this is what you ought to do. And the people of Israel said, thanks, but no thanks. We don't want to do that. Watch verse 17 of Jeremiah chapter 6. But I set watchmen over you, saying, Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. And they said, we will not pay attention. I at least fully appreciate the honesty of their hearts. Because most of us would say, yep, yep, I'll do that. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. I I fully intend to do that, and that's what I do. They said, thanks, but no thanks. We've got things figured out. He said in verse 17, Pay attention, listen to the watchmen, the people that I've put in your life that maybe are sounding the trumpets to get us to wake up. It doesn't have to necessarily be a physical trumpet that somebody's playing. It might be somebody who is a voice of reason, who's trying to speak truth, who's alarming us to something to say, your life's getting a little bit off track and we are simply saying, nope, thanks, but no thanks. Don't want to hear it. And what if God is placing people within our lives in the context of church, in the context of, 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 a, of a faithful uh, Christian family member, friend, coworker, somebody who might actually be trying to sound the trumpets, if you will, that God has put into our lives for a reason, and we might actually be saying, nope, I don't want to do that. I don't want to listen to that. The question is, are we ready? Or... Are we simply just ignoring the trumpet blast? Is God somehow trying to get a hold of our lives to get our attention? Is there something going on right now, right within our weeks, that it might just be that whole anti-coincidental theology thing we talked about last week? God trying to speak something into our lives. It might just be that. Sometimes some of us are the, those people that are sitting and waiting. I'm just waiting for God. I'm waiting for God, waiting for God's voice. He's going to speak to me. 
what if God is actually speaking? I, I'm going to chop it up, but there's an illustration that's gone around for a while about uh, a flood and climbed upon the roof of their house and like a boat came by and said, hey, let me help you out. No, 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 God's going to save me. God's going to save me. I'm gonna, and then a helicopter and something else comes by to say, everybody, let, let me help you. Let me save you. No, 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 God's going to save me. God is going to save me. They die. They go to heaven and say, God, where were you? I sent a boat. I sent a plane. I sent a helicopter. I sent all these things. I sent all this stuff. I, I've, I've worked with and counseled people so often over the years that will say things like, I'm just waiting for God to speak. And sometimes the very thing in which they're asking and waiting for God, my, my very try to be kind and, and, and generous and, and graceful answer is, God did speak. 2,000 years ago in there. And, and the answer is right here. On sometimes the very issue we're asking questions about, the answer is right here. But I just don't want to listen to that. I want something that's really honestly what I want to hear, not what God's saying. What does God want from our lives and our church right here and right now? If we're called to wake up, to me, that's the next question. What does God want for our church, for our lives right here, right now? What does he want? What does he want? We've been talking the last few weeks about our church and different things that are happening, exciting things that are happening, uh, good problems that we're having and space issues and all of these different things. So what does God want for us right here, right now, with this journey that we're going on the next few months and some of the transitions we're making? I know that some of us, and I admitted that I've been struggling with the same thing, could say, but I'm not willing to do that. I want us to be the same old church that we've always been. But what if God actually wants something for us that's bigger? and beyond what our minds would even think. Would we allow God to do that? That's honestly the next question in that. Would we allow it? What if God wants me, you, us, individually, to step out of our comfort zones, to do something that we just simply don't want to do? What if God might ask us to suffer a little bit, to grow in an area of our lives? What if God is speaking into our lives about something he wants us to say, to do, to be a part of, what does God want? Part of these next seven days of all for us would be those questions. God, what do you want from me right here, right now? What do you want from me as a part of CBC if CBC is your home? What do you want from us? Are we being prepared and woken up to something big that God wants to do in our midst right now? I'll tell you, for me, with the journey I've been on as far as CBC, I, I believe that with all my heart. I believe with all my heart that a struggle that I've had over the last year of wanting us to be the same little church that we've always been, I feel with all my heart that God is waking us up to something that he wants to do in and around our midst. I don't know exactly what that is, but I feel that that's where God's leading us. Too often what happens is we have more of what I might call alarm clock theology. And the snooze button becomes our great comfort. <laughs> Any snooze button folks here this morning? I, something's wrong with my phone. Every time my alarm goes off, the button that I hit just shuts the whole thing down. I, mean, I need a tech person to help me out, figure out how to do that, because I used to hit the snooze like 10 times. Now I can't. It's one time, and I can't figure it out, and i got to remember to get up. What's the snooze? What's the snooze button? Hey, the alarm has sounded. It's time to wake up. It's time to get going. Just give me, whatever, five more minutes. What is it, 10? Five, 10. See... See, all of us have a different snooze theology. We have a different snooze theology. I've got five more minutes to get out the door. I've got ten more minutes. I've got seven minutes. I think sometimes in our own lives, in our own faith, that's what we do. We hear the trumpet and we think, you know what? That's right. That's right. I'm so glad I came to church today because there's some things I want to get right and I'm going to get to those things. But first, you know, I got little kids and I got to get them out of the house first. Then I'll get to that. You know, but first, I got, I got this really busy season of life. I got this thing going on at work. I'm going to get to that in a few months. Then I will get to that. And so our snooze button is different for all of us. But at some point, you know, when, when I'm retired, I will have time. When I, when I have these things going on in my life that are kind of fixed or out of the way, I will have time. You just, things are too busy right now. God, I'm with you. I want to be with you. But realistically, you know, come on. That's the snooze button theology that becomes our great, great comfort. But 
there is wisdom in the fact that three times this psalm is quoted in the book of Hebrews. That's part of our reading for the month. Three times Hebrews quotes this psalm that says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Whether we want to admit it or not, every time we hit the snooze, my heart hardens a little bit towards that annoying clock that keeps ringing. The Psalms say, and three times the author of Hebrews tells us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but respond, do something. Take some time this week, these 10 days of all, seven days for us to live in reverence in fear and repentance of God and ask him those big questions of what is it that you want? How are you preparing me? What do you want to say to me today? Again, football players today didn't just show up. They have been in a time of training and a time of preparation so that when one o'clock the alarm sounds, they are ready to go. Many of you have heard me say many different times, one of my Bible college professors used to say to us, I don't even remember which one it was now, but he would say to us, Bible students, as a pastor, you need to be ready to preach, pray, and die at any moment because you never know when God might call you to do one of those things. I tell our band all the time, we need to be ready to sing, pray, and die so if you need to carry a, a, a little ukulele with you, what do you need to carry? A harmonica? Whatever you got to carry, you better be ready. If somebody's at a house and somebody says, you know, we ought to have a song. You know what? I'm ready. I've got my trumpet right here. Let's go. Be ready to pre preach, pray, and die. Be ready to sing, pray, and die. Be ready to give an answer for your faith because you never know when God might call you in some moment of your life to say, here it is. It's you. And sometimes we're praying, God, send someone to help these people. And God might be saying, I did. It's you. It's you. You're the one. In a month, we're going to spend two months in Exodus. And we're going to see a man who God's, God's said, said to God, God, send someone to help the people of Israel out of bondage. They need someone to get them out of there. God said, I got the perfect person. And it's Moses. Moses said, but I don't know how to speak. I stutter. We're going to look at that. What if you are the one that God is calling? The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? The rabbis would teach their students. Students, repent one day before you die. Now, when I was a student in high school, I would have said, that sounds awesome, uh, I'll do that. <laughs> now, now I'm just going to do whatever I want to do for the next however many years, and when that day comes, then I'll get my life, life right with God. But the more astute students in the room, the people that really, they would ask, but Rabbi, how do I know what day that is? To which the rabbi would say, precisely. Since you don't know what day that will be, Repent every day. Get your life right with God every day because today just might be your last day. Not necessarily the most flowerful thought to think about, but it is reality. Get our lives right with God. Be ready today. Let me close with Hebrews since we're spending time in it this month and challenging you to read it, it's, it fits so much with what we're talking about in these fall feasts and it really just brings to life how Jesus is the fulfillment of these fall feasts, how, how Jesus might be that trumpet of God calling in our, blowing in our ears, reminding us to wake up, how Jesus is that one in the call of the trumpet of God and us rising up and being with Christ in heaven forever. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. He says, <clears throat> since therefore it remains for some to enter it, those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. And again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and it is active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since therefore we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The trumpet has sounded. The call of God, I believe, is placed upon our lives. The question is, how will we respond? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these moments to, together today. I pray that through the guidance and leading of your Holy Spirit that you would draw us deeper and deeper into a relationship with yourself. I pray that you would guide us into a deeper and a richer understanding of your word, all of which only overflows out of our lives into our families and communities around us, speaking about the life that is truly life, that is found in you and your son, Jesus Christ. Father, guide us in these moments together over these days and these weeks to come as I pray that each of us would enter into a time of self-examination, of awe and reverence, of remembrance and repentance, longing to hear what you have to say to our lives and to our church. Father, thank you for the gifts that you give to us each and every day and moment of our lives and for the gift of this trumpet call which just might wake us up, call us to arms, and to take action for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If there's any